mọi người tôi là chi yong của bệnh viện đa khoa singapore trong bài báo cáo ngày hôm nay tôi muốn trình bày về vai trò của chẩn đoán ngành trong đánh giá cái sự mất tuấn khớp vai tôi không có xung đột về mặt tài chính presentation is targeted at general radiologists, residents in sports medicine, orthopedics and diagnostic radiology. By the end of this 20 minute talk, you will understand the broad basic concepts to shoulder instability, be able to discuss the appropriateness of different imaging modalities and also identify some common imaging findings in patients with shoulder instability. To achieve our learning objectives, I will first introduce the clinical context and biomechanics of shoulder instability. I will then run through the choices available to image the shoulder before showing you some of the common imaging findings in the bone and soft tissue. The shoulder glenohumeral humeral joint is a bone and socket joint. It has the greatest range of motion in any major articulation in the human body. The trade-off for this mobility is vulnerability to injuries and development of shoulder instability. Structures around and within the joint provide some form of stabilization. They can be divided into dynamic stabilizers, for example, the rotator cuff muscles, and static stabilizers, for example, the glenoid labrum. These structures act in two major mechanisms for stabilization, concavity compression, scapulohumeral balance. In particular, the presence of an intact glenoid labrum is important to both mechanisms. If you zoom into the anatomy of the glenohumeral joint, you will notice that there are thicken bands of the joint capsule that form the superior, middle and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. These ligaments serve as a form of static stabilizers in varying degrees of shoulder internal external rotation and adduction. In particular, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament which is attached to the anterior inferior glenoid labrum serve as a primary restraint against anterior inferior dislocation at 90 degrees of abduction and external rotation. Shoulder instability is a spectrum of disorders that can be divided into three major categories. On one end of the spectrum, you have the atraumatic type of disorders that are related to subluxation and laxity. In the middle, you have the microtraumatic causes that are related to microinstability and also overstretched shoulder syndromes. Finally, the focus of our talk today is pertaining to the microtraumatic disorders such as anterior inferior glenohumeral dislocation. Shoulder dislocations account for up to 50% of all dislocations in the body and prevalence is about 2% in the general population. In younger patients, there's a high risk of repeated dislocation after the first incidence. Surgical management of patients with microtraumatic shoulder instability is dependent on number one, patient lifestyle factors, and number two, imaging findings. In most simple cases with an anterior labor tear, the patient undergoes a arthroscopic bank card repair where the tear is repaired through ankle sutures as shown by the spot images on the right. In more complex cases with varying degrees of glenoid bone loss or heel sex lesion, patient may undergo a lethargy procedure or a vimpersage procedure to account for this increased risk of repeated dislocation. Next, we move on to the choice of imaging modalities. There are three imaging modalities available for assessment of shoulder instability, X-rays, CT and MRI. X-rays are useful in detection of associated bony injuries post anterior inferior glenohumeral humeral dislocation. In fact, they are a prosthetic criteria in the instability severity score, which is used by orthopedic surgeons to decide whether the patient goes for arthroscopic repair or open surgery such as like the J procedure. On the image on the left, an AP view in internal rotation, we can see the heel sex lesion, which is a bony depression at the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head after impactation at the glenoid rim. On the image of the right, or AP view in external rotation, you can see a bony fragment at the inferior aspect of the glenoid rim representing a glenoid bone loss or bony bank heart lesion. Several special X-ray views are available, for example, the Bernard Gill's view, 
which allow us to quantify the degree of glenoid bone loss on x-rays. However, these methods are perceived as less accurate compared to advanced cross-sectional imaging such as CT and MRI. CT scan is considered the gold standard in measurements of bony defects post anterior and inferior glenoid humeral dislocation. The high resolution ability to manipulate images as well as create 3D reconstructions allow for very accurate measurements of glenoid bone loss and severity of HUSAC lesions. On the other hand, to assess for any labral ligamentous injuries, we definitely need to do an MRI shoulder given the vastly superior soft tissue contrast. People often ask, can you get away with a simple routine MRI or you need to do a MRI with arthrogram as shown on the images on the right to distend the joint so that you can diagnose labral tests more accurately. Well, the literature is slightly mixed, but most people do agree that by distending the joint, we will be able to make labral tests a bit more apparent and diagnose them with slightly more confidence. Of course, clinicians will need to weigh the benefits of increased diagnostic confidence against the risk of an invasive arthrogram procedure. I think the good guideline to follow is that if your patient just had a recent dislocation or have very severe instability symptoms, you might be able to get away with a routine MRI because like the image on the right, they tend to have some inherent joint effusion that is reactive. On the other hand, if I have a patient that has very chronic or vague symptoms, they are likely to have any underlying joint effusion. So giving some contrast into the joint to distend it will probably increase our diagnostic accuracy. When protocoling MRI shoulder for instability, you might also want to consider performing scans in special positions such as able view, abduction and external rotation, which theoretically will put the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament into tension, thereby optimizing the penetration of contrast material into any tear. Okay, a word of caution if you intend to use your MRI to assess the degree of glenoid bone loss. I think most of the study has shown that are slightly less accurate compared to CT, but if you really have to, uh, you might want to try to do a 3D reformat using your MRI images, which will kind of increase the accuracy. Okay, we reached the halfway point of our talk. From now onwards, I will be showing you several features that you need to be looking out for when assessing for shoulder instability. We will start with bone findings first, in particular demonstrating how you measure for glenoid bone loss and explaining the on and off track theory. If you view the glenoid on face using a 3D reconstruction, you should be able to appreciate a slightly pad-shaped appearance of the glenoid articular surface as shown by the image on the left. At the inferior half of the glenoid, normally you will be able to fit a best fit circle fully. On the other hand, image on the right shows a patient with shoulder instability and glenoid bone loss. The deficiency of the best fit circle inferiorly annotates the degree of bone loss. Commonly, critical bone loss can be ranged from 20 to 25% uh, according to surgeon preferences. If you do not have access to 3D formats, there are also other established measurement methods to quantify degree of glenoid bone loss on sagittal CT reconstructs of the scapula such as the PICO method and the ratio method. We can also use imaging to assess the dynamic interaction of glenoid bone loss and heel sex lesions. When the heel sex lesion is large, there is a chance that the glenoid rim will engage into the heel sex lesion on abduction of the shoulder. Using the glenoid choid on-off theory, we can assess this likelihood which will inform the surgeon whether they need to do additional surgery to correct for this risk. Measurements of the glenoid tract and the heel sex interval can be acquired from 3D reformatted CT images.
Some studies have also shown promising results to measure these parameters on MRI studies. Exact measurement methodologies are beyond the scope of this presentation but can be readily found in many various literature. Moving on to soft tissue abnormalities that can be seen on MRI. There are many different classically described injury patterns such as Bankart, Spertis, Elpsa, Hegel, Glad and Slab. We will go through each of them highlighting the specific differences. Finally, we will also show you some variants that might be pitfalls in diagnosing these abnormalities. But before we get into the specific labor tear patterns, we should set some ground rules on how we describe labor tears on MRI. First, describing a location. Image on the left, a sagittal on face view of the glenoid demonstrates the two common methods. First, a clock face approach, where 12 o'clock is the most superior point in searching on the biceps long head, 3 is anterior, 9 is posterior, and 6 o'clock is inferiorly. This applies to both left and right shoulder. We can also use the six zones, anterior, superior, superior, posterior, superior, posterior, inferior, inferior, anterior, inferior. Both methods work equally well. Second of all, there are some diagnostic cues we should look out for when differentiating labor tests from labor variants. For example, when there is intrasubstance signal intensity within the labor material, when the labor itself has irregular margins, when the signal anomality within the rabium is orientated not parallel to the glenoid margin, when the space, the cleft, is more than 2 mm or more than 2.5 mm, or they are associated parallel labor cysts. These clues actually point us towards labor tear rather than variance. The Bankart lesion is the classical labor ligamentous complex injury after anterior inferior shoulder dislocation. This involves avulsion of the anterior inferior labrum with disruption of its adjacent periosteal sleeve. The axial MRI image of the shoulder on the right demonstrates this very nicely. The arrow points towards the avulsed anterior inferior labrum while the arrowhead shows the disrupted adjacent attaching periosteal sleeve. When the labrum is separated from the underlying cartilage, but still remains partially attached to the glenoid rim by an intact periosteal sleeve, we are looking at a pertis lesion. Because the periosteal sleeve is still weak, the inferior glenohumeral ligament loses its function and the shoulder becomes unstable. Axial image on the right demonstrates this. The arrow points towards the slightly disrupted inferior labrum, while the arrowhead shows the intact periosteal sleeve. Pertis lesion can result from either dislocation or cumulative stresses on the inferior glenohumeral ligament owing to physical overuse and repetitive trauma. Next, we move on to the Elpsa lesion or the anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. The Elpsa lesion is more common in chronic instability and may arise from a previous Pertis lesion. With repeated dislocation or subluxation, the labral ligamentous complex retracts medially within the intact periosteal sleeve, growing up like a shirt sleeve. It can scar down to the glenoid neck and become immobile, as demonstrated in the axial imaging on the right where we see a soft tissue scarring in the anterior aspect of the glenoid neck. Because the diagnosis of oxalation is most certain when the inferior glenohumeral ligament can be identified, it might be better seen on the MRI arthrography. Next, the GLAD or the glenolabral articular disruption. The GLAD lesion combines a labral tear with an adjacent cartilage defect. In the axial MRI image on the right, we can see an anterior inferior labral tear as pointed out by the arrowhead. And just next to it, there is a cartilage defect as annotated by the arrow. When the labral tear is minimal or mild, Patients will complain of pain for the osteochondrolation rather than instability itself. In Hegel or humeral avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, 
the injury is no longer at the labrum but more periphery at the humeral attachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament anterior band. Coronal image on the left demonstrates this nicely. There is a J sign due to the retracted stump of the anterior band inferior glenohumeral ligament pointed out by the arrows. This injury is much easier to diagnose acutely post dislocation within seven days of trauma. In chronic cases where the tissue has healed and remodeled, the IgL disruption might be hard to detect though it otherwise remains incompetent. Next, we will touch briefly on the slab lesion. A slab lesion is the tear of the superior labrum, usually centered at the long head biceps tendon origin that can extend into the anterior or posterior labrum. The slab lesion actually falls within the realm of micro-instability rather than the other conditions described which falls under the dislocation-related macro-traumatic instability issues. Clinical diagnosis of the slab lesions is difficult as most patients present with non-specific shoulder pain and has no objective clinical instability. As you can see from the table on the left, there are multiple classification of slab lesions. I would say you should only need to be familiar with the first four types. Type 1 is a plain old frame of the superior labrum. Type 2 is a simple tear of the biceps labral complex superiorly. Type 3 is the displaced bucket handle tear. Type 4 is a bucket handle tear as well but with biceps tendon extension. Some examples of slab lesions. Coronal image on the left demonstrates a type 3 slab tear. The arrowhead points to the displaced buck handle flap from a superior labral tear while the arrow points to a normal looking long hip biceps tendon inserting into the superior aspect of the glenoid. Coronal image on the right on the other hand demonstrates another superior labrum buck handle tear but now the adjacent long hip biceps tendon insertion is irregular and attenuated so this actually represents a type 4 slap tear. A good guide to describing these slap lesions is that instead of worrying about the classifications, you should just focus on describing the location of the labral tear, trying to decide if there's any involvement of the long head biceps tendon, delineate the extension of the labral tear, whether anterior or posteriorly, describe any free fragments and associated injuries within the shoulder joint. Finally, do be aware that there are morphological findings in glenoid labrum that looks like tears but actually represent normal variants. This includes sublabral sulcus, sublabral foramen, pseudo slab, and cartilage undercutting. If you follow the diagnostic cues for diagnosis of labral tears described earlier, you should be able to differentiate variants and tears with confidence. For example, in this coronal and axial MI arthrogram images of a same patient, we see that there is a thin, smooth fluid cleft in the superior labrum that parallels the glenoid margin in orientation and does not violate the labral substance. This is interpreted as a sublabral sulcus rather than a superior labral tear. We have come to the end of this presentation. At this point, I would like to summarize and highlight some key take-home messages. There are wide causes of shoulder instability with varied clinical complications. X-rays, CT and MRI plays key roles in the workup of shoulder instability. Bone deficiency may necessitate additional surgical procedures such as letter J and Mimpersage procedures. MRI is slightly advantageous in the diagnosis of labor tear compared to conventional 3T MRI, though can be omitted in the acute post dislocation phase. Understanding classical tear and variant morphologies of glenoid labrum on MRI improves diagnostic accuracy. This is a list of references used in this presentation, which also provides a good reading list if you require more 
information on shoulder instability. I thank you. Thank for you so much, Professor.